Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. We have very active lifestyles. It's not all wandering the countryside aimlessly or scaring passing motorists. And we all love a good cup of joe. And there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. Bold, robust, delicious. It's coffee that can wake the dead. <laughs> With over a dozen different roasts and flavors, Deadly Grounds can satisfy the most finicky of coffee addicts. The aroma is so intoxicating, it brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. Persons under 18 will not be admitted. Oops. <laughs> yeah, it's Wednesday, everybody. And as always, you know, Leo's not here to push the wrong buttons, but I am. <laughs> so, Somebody's got to do it. Well, right, right. You know, and yeah, I screwed up the whole beginning of this. And hey, it's just the way it goes. Too bad. What was supposed <laughs> to happen? I missed it. Well, normally it would come in 
like this and I go, Hey, it's Wednesday, everybody. Welcome oh. to the show. But you know, I kind of screwed that up right off the get go. So I'm just going to go like this. <laughs> well, you did it already, but yeah. I did ask you for the intro. So, so now you got to do both. So congratulations. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, as you can see folks, uh, nobody up here is who's supposed to be here, but that's okay. They are supposed to be here. So let's welcome my man, Rico. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me, Ben. I appreciate it, man. Y'all know Pops Van Zant down in the corner, the madman himself, and our amazing guest, Stuart Fratkin. Did I say that per correctly? That's my name, Stuart Fratkin. That's it. It's Let really hard to screw that up. But you almost well, did, I guess. I don't know. Well, yeah, you know. I could have put an N in there and said Fr Frankin or something. That's, you know. that's true. Or you could have said Franklin, which, uh, you know, I get sometimes. Or <laughs> if I'm at Starbucks, my name is George. So there's George. that. My name okay. is George. Why my George? George. <laughs> Fuck knows. But... <laughs> yeah, why cannot, do they want to know I, my name? I just want some coffee. Why do they got to know my name? It's right. one of those like classic, like, what's your name, Stuart? And then I get it. And I get my cup and it says George. So, and it's happened a couple of times. So I assume it's me. <laughs> so my, my question is, is George's coffee just as good as Stuart's? Well, it it is. It's one in the same, Ben. So it is what, I, it is what I just want to make sure. Just want to make sure, you know. No, I ordered the Americano. Why do I have a frozen latte? What the hell's going on here? Well, an Americano, come on. Americano is just coffee with water, right? That's, yeah, that's what that's what that's what I learned when traveling throughout Europe. Yeah, which I, which I don't like that that version. What? Of you don't want to taste the tears of the peasants that pulled up those seeds, bro? Like they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> just remember, Ben, you invited me. <laughs> You're right. I did. I did. Shit. <laughs> Listen, guys, I don't have anything to compare it to. So what I've seen thus far, I'm thrilled. And that intro was awesome. That was all the man behind the keyboard, Mr. Leo Pond, the producer and owner and the man that runs the Dorkening Podcast Network. That was awesome. That was yeah, very he, he does. He does an amazing job for us. Um, every season, I'll call him up in December. This is my Is that Jeff? Yeah, hope you're feeling better. You know, Hi, Jeff, we miss you. I don't Jeff, know I don't you. miss you. If you don't feel that well, you shouldn't be on Facebook. What are you doing? Messaging <laughs> me. You should be in bed. He's probably in bed with his feet up. And but Jeff, the question, the sixty-four thousand dollars question is: <laughs> What was that, Stuart? I was going to say, do you have COVID? No, he's uh, got. Uh, he gets like really bad uh, sinus infections and chest colds from it. Oh. So it's kind of sitting. He said he's kind of sitting right here. Oh, that sucks. It, and I kind of hope it drops like out of him because we hit the road Friday for a three day cannabis event um, at Mohegan Sun. Oh, nice. Oh, so, wow. Cocaine's yeah. a hell of a drug. <laughs> <laughs> Who invited you? You did, remember? Oh, I did. I did. You're right. You're right. But it's not about us or, or our co host. And it, it's about this amazing gentleman down here or over here, depending on where you're watching us. Um, in, the, in the amazing wow. career that you've had. There's I mean, like, okay. like, I'm looking at my show notes, and you've been in just about every single TV show that I have ever fucking watched. Like, seriously. From the 80s, yes, from yeah. the 80s and the 90s, I did quite a bit of TV and some film, yeah. I, 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 I got a question right from the get-go from one of them older, older shows. Go for it. Sliders, dude. Oh, yeah. Sliders was one of my favorite shows. Jerry O'Connell, you know, yeah. I mean, he's a comic book guy. So, you know, I was kind of big when I was happy when they – made sliders into a comic book um what was it like working with those guys because that looked like a fun cast to hang out with you know what i think the majority of my scenes were not with the main cast but i <sighs> what i do remember was filming at universal and uh looking over the san fernando valley where universal studios is located and, you know, at that time, a lot of what I was doing, a lot of those guest spots were for um, for money. 
Um, and eventually, coincidentally enough, I met a director uh, off on an audition for a commercial shoot named John Landis, who um, produced that show. And so that was one of the reasons why I got hired to be in this commercial uh, with John. And then I subsequently went on to work with him like five more times after that. So that's about the connection. That's the only connection I can make as far as sliders is concerned. Otherwise, to be honest, I don't even remember watching it. <laughs> so, that's cool though. Know. You had that's cool though. You had something that came out of that that turned into more and more work. You know what I mean? It's like, so I'm glad I brought it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's rare. I will tell you one podcast I did a year or so ago. The podcaster said he, he talked to his mom and dad about who he was going to interview. And his mom and dad said he was on a show called Adam 12. And this was the reboot of Adam 12. The new, the new, the new Adam. Adam 12. And I was blown away because that in all of my years, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm 59. Yeah. I've never had anybody ever say the new Adam 12 to me other than, you know, me. When I looked right. at your, at your bio, I noticed that I'm 20 days older than you. 20, no shit. 20 days. I'm the wow. second. You're the 22nd. So for all them Burgos from the year of the year of the rabbit, right? Yeah. I got you. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm right on the cusp. Yeah, he is. He's right on the cusp. You know, if we had kicked him a little longer, he would have been in my category of the Libras. Yeah, Libra. yeah. You know, I'm just saying. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you were on a ton of TV shows. I mean, the Facts of Life. Yes. You know, I mean, touched by an angel. I believe. On, on different things. Yes. Right. Right. Matlock. I mean. Yes. Knott's Landing, Quantum Leap. We could just go on forever, you know? Yeah. Old school. Those are old school. Yeah. Shows. Well, I'm 50, so that's my era. Oh, God, am I the youngest person in here? Yes, yes you, you are. are. You're, you're the baby. You're the baby. <laughs> you know? Um, All right. Then. You, and, and I, you can be the oldest if you'd like, Rico. Oh, <laughs> oh hey, man. My age I is about to show. I still go back. Yeah, I still go back and watch a lot of those TV shows. There was a lot of those shows that you did one or two or three episodes, but the, the one that stands out to me is they came from outer space. I was, was going to ask that. I was going to ask that. That was, <laughs> that was <laughs> Pops, you beat me to it. No, no, no. Go, Pops, go. do you no, have something? Go, Rico. <laughs> do you want me to go? <laughs> go, yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Stewart, um, that was a great show for the time that it was in because that show was basically also competing. Was Friends in 91 or 94? 94. Okay, the never mind. I forgot what other show was competing in ninety one with. But one of my questions to you is that show was only on for two seasons and I feel like it was so it had some humor in it and it had a lot of like family family sort of comedy. Do you feel like that's something that you would revive or you think that someone would revive that show in today's in today's environment now with the technology we have? It's a great question. Uh so you want to hear a funny story. So that, first of all, that show is, I love that show. I love doing that show. And there is something very stony about that show too. So I know the, which I want to get to about why the podcast is called still token. I, I assume I know why, but when we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about that, but that definitely, that show was very stony. There was, you know, a part of my youth that was uh, that dictated the humor in that show. But uh, would it survive? So maybe I think that I think what Dean and I did on that show was really just a bunch of impro improvising, having fun, you know, making up shit. That was what we did every day. And that's what they hired us to do. That's what so it's supposed to be about. The, that's, I mean, that's, that's, and the, the other, so two stories on that. So the, there was a show several years later that I don't know if you guys remember this show. Cause I, I, I didn't know until they asked me to go on it simply because they liked, they came from outer space. There was a show called homeboys in outer space. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -mm. That was on one of the, you know, fifth, six networks and they loved 
our show. So they asked me to be on their show as a cameo. So they did it, you know, simply because of the love of that show. So that doesn't really answer your question, Rico. It does allow me to go on a, a mini tangent, but I love that show. I love they came from inner space. Love it. It's, it's a very soft spot in my heart. I think. I think. I think it's a hilarious uh, show. You knew it was right. Gonna- one of the one of the questions that I wanted to ask you also was, if you if you believe that if the show hypothetically speaking was to be revived since you brought up that it's kind of like a very like weedy like not weedy uh like stoner type of show right uh do you think that mr chong would be making an appearance on that since he's still doing shows and stuff oh totally i'd make an appearance on that i I think we all would make an appearance on that yeah i know mr chong definitely would this is totally one of those shows where if you if you if you watched all the episodes, a lot of people that were on that show eventually were people that you would recognize, you know, uh, those that were, you know, around in the 80s and, you know, the 70s and the 60s. One of one of the episodes we had, well, there were two people that I remember specifically, but Ruth Buzzy was on one of the episodes and you know for those of us that are over 50 remember ruth buzzy from laughing days and that was an absolute incredible thrill to have her um on one of those episodes but those kind of cool people so i could definitely see tommy chong being on one of the episodes we would ask oh i know he would i know he would say yes oh yeah i mean he, he said yes to coming on our show i mean yeah. <laughs> he's been on my show three times dude like yeah he would a hundred percent say this well, that's because you're yes. a Tommy Chong, you, you know. <laughs> Never mind. Dude, I, I listen, I did not grow up with none of this stuff. I started discovering all of this culture in 2008, my man. So I have a lot of catching up to do. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, I grew up listening to Cheech and Chong records. That was my that was my jam. Dude, that was me. It was yep. all albums before I'd ever seen, you know, yep. any of their live shows. I or- remember cassette tapes. That's as far back as I can go. So I'm you missed something, yeah. Rico. Missed one it. of their albums, <laughs> they did an album called Big Bamboo. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. in Big Bamboo, you open up the album and inside of it were rolling papers. Rolling paper, yeah. Big ones. Yeah, yeah. gigantic yeah. ones. Oh, yeah. Gigantic. It, was the, it was the size of the album. Yeah. yeah. I bet you I still got it in the attic somewhere. Yeah. Oh, I for sure have it. I kept all that shit. All that. Oh, Stuart, we yeah. got to make this happen. Like this needs to happen. Like this, what, the this reboot? is Re- Rico is going. He's going for the reboot, folks. Hey, next generation, whatever you know, um, senior right? version, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Um, they came from outer space again. Do whatever. <laughs> Bro, at well, this I point, mean, it would be more like a documentary with everything that's happening nowadays. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what is this real? <laughs> there was a lot of political shit going on in that at that time, and you, you know, we don't need to get into it. But I mean, that was definitely a, a it was a great, it was a fun show to be on. I remember, um, so Dean and I had worked together previously on that summer on a movie called Ski School. Ski School, yes. And uh, yeah, I remember that one too. <laughs> that was that's one of those movies that lives on in cult infamy. Yeah. I mean, it probably is one of the movies, and you know, besides some of the stuff that we've talked about that I'm known for. But Dean and I met on that movie, and and immediately, you know, formed a chemistry that was just you know clearly we just well worked well together. So improvised a lot my background was in improvisation. So after we came back from shooting that movie in Canada, we became like good friends. And then a bunch of shows started coming up that we both auditioned for. So this came up and this was to launch a fifth network called the Hollywood Premier Network. And it was going to be launched with two other shows called, do you remember these two shows called She Wolf of London? Yep. And the other one was called. Oh, shoot. I don't remember the other one. I don't remember the other one, but there were three shows. Mine was one of them, but they came from outer space. She Wolf of London. And I 
Oh, Shades of L.A. I cannot believe I remember that. Shades of L.A. No, I don't remember that. So the idea they were going to launch these three shows together and they were going to try to create this fifth network that eventually turned into the WB, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, here in L.A. Uh, it was the, it was aired locally. Mm-hmm. It was aired in uh, a few markets, L.A., New York, and I think um, New Mexico, which is strange. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so Dean and I came back from, uh, from ski school and then we got the script together and we thought, why don't we audition together playing these different roles? So we were both going to go in for the same role, but we split them up. So that's sort of how that all started. Got the ball rolling. That's pretty cool. So we improvised all this shit, all this stuff on our audition. We just didn't care. So we made up all this stuff and one of the things, so if you watch the show, one of the um, signature uh, improvs that we did was a takeoff on a movie called uh, Crazy People. That movie was with, um, I want to say Dudley, have you ever heard of it? Dudley Moore, David Paymer. It does. It does sound familiar. David Paymer's character actor. It all. It all take. It took place in like a, in a psychiatric ward, and it was supposed to be a comedy. But David Paymer played a a guy who um, his issue was everything that he picked up, he would greet. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Hello. Dudley Moore, Daryl Hannah, Paul Reisner. Yeah. 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 That's okay. it. All right. That. Yeah. That's why it sounded familiar. Right. So, so I, I, I have seen it. Yeah. So David Paymer was everything he picked up. He went, hello, how are you? How you doing? Hello, bottle. Nice to see you. And so <laughs> Dean and I thought that was hysterical. So everything we picked up while we we're working on ski school, everything we picked up, we did the same thing. Hello, Penn. How are you? Oh, how are you? So then he, anyway, so that translated into this song that we made up for They Came From Outer Space called Hi, Hello, How Are You? So if you watch that show, that's where that came from. So we did that on the audition and they did not know what to make of it. In fact, one of the producers said at the end of our first audition, we just made up so much stuff. We did the script, but we made up all this stuff. One of the producers said, what did, oh, love the writing, hated the acting. <laughs> that's what his, his feedback was. Eventually we, we booked it. That's a little right. history, a little, little bit more than you wanted probably to know. No, no, no. no that's great. Not. That's great. Absolutely and not. just real quick to all our viewers and listeners later, if you want to find out more about the amazing guest that we have tonight, make sure you check the show notes up above or down below, depending on where you're watching or listening to us. So, and cool. all his, all his socials are in there, links to his websites. So that's, that's where it's at. You can ask me anything. And i you, my career is, is an open book, and, and so all the stories I tell are all true. So anything you want to ask, ask away. I got another question, Stuart. Uh, Mr. Stewart, I'm sorry. Um, Why are you calling me Mr. Stewart? It's, Do I like it's you? just... It's, are you, it's are you my maid? It's, <laughs> I am brown. I'm brown enough, Stuart. Look, like we can make this happen. That's what I my maid calls me. I don't understand why she calls me that either. It's just Stuart. It's, it's, I'm losing control here. Um, <laughs> you you have like a very, which is rare in, in actors and in writers and all these, all these little things that you can do in Hollywood. You have a really diverse set of movies that you've done from Teen Wolf 2 to It Came From Space to you've done cameos and Guyver. How did you, had you planned that out that you just wanted to grab anything that happened or how did you pick like what was gonna, where were you were gonna go? I think originally when I first started in 1984, I just wanted to act. And so um, because my background was uh, uh, in improv, a lot of what I did lent itself to comedy. So most of the auditions that I had around that time, 84 to, you know, 94, I would improvise. Um, and so that lent itself to comedy. So, uh, so 
originally I think that I got cast a lot as like the 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 best friend's lead. That's just kind of and as an actor you have to embrace that. And if you don't embrace it and you push against it, then you're probably going to not work a lot. And you're going to push against type. So I mean I thought at that time best way for me to be a working actor was to work, was to get jobs. And then eventually when I grew up or I got older, you know, there was the, the business forced me to be an adult. So that's so transitioning going from playing high school in Beans Baxter and some of the other stuff mm -hmm. um, and then going to uh, play uh, in Teen Wolf 2. I was in college and then, you know, they came from outer space, was like a, a, a young adult comedy once again. Eventually, you know, I sort of transitioned into roles like playing attorneys on Courthouse and NYPD Blue. And, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, you know, uh, there was a show I was on called um, Murder One, Philly. Uh, those, so it sort of was a so a move for as for necessity. It really, was it wasn't a plan at all. I mean, I think that's what a lot of actors do do and some are successful out of it on it at, on it rico and some you know don't do it anymore because they made choices you know I, I i've worked with actors who made those choices early on and then never worked again because no one wanted to work no one wanted to work with them because they were either assholes or they simply didn't want to work on projects that i you know that i would work on it's interesting you say that because um, that's a question that I always ask people when we're talking about acting is, do you fear being cast type? Because you look at people like Stephen Amell, for example, he did Arrow for nine years mm -hmm. and now it's like you're Green Arrow. But he got out of that and started doing action movies, whereas uh, the man who played Superman in Smallville, he was like cast type for a very long time and he didn't do much after that. How do you how do you handle or how do you recommend someone handling avoiding avoiding that or going with the with the wave? Well, there's a lot of actors who have been able to do that successfully break out of that, and I would I would definitely uh, I'd point to two specifically in my head because those people made those choices. Michael Keaton, you know, certainly is one of them, who was in um, uh, originally was a night shift and then when that when obviously his career took off you know he he rode that way and johnny dangerously mr yeah. mom mr mom you know, yeah uh, be, uh then he was you know it was in beetlejuice but then it was i remember reading that he wanted to he would do beetlejuice he would took the role in beetlejuice if he could play batman in tim burton's movie and they were like the executives like what the fuck? what that that's not something that we see you doing and so he was like listen they go together i'm do Beetlejuice. this is my understanding i'll do beetlejuice if i can get cast in batman so eventually he he then you know started to do more dramatic roles he was in one of my favorite movies it's it, it's and it was he was in it is one it's it is one of those little known movies um called clean and sober mm. Yep, you don't know it. Or no, what is that? What is that about? Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so <laughs> it was after he. I think he. It was a couple of years after Batman, right? So he was already starting to transition out of comedy, wanted to do more dramatic roles, and he took on this role. It was directed by Glenn Glenn Gordon Glenn Gordon Karen, I think, who did Moonlighting. It's about a man who is uh, addicted to coke, and he is a very. See, I said it in the beginning. It's a hard drug, man. Yeah, well, watch this. It's painful to watch this movie, and it's an amazing performance. It's heartbreaking, and I just remember at that time in my career making an impact on me because I was, you know, still studying quite a bit. I wanted, you know, I was doing a lot of theater, so I was thinking, you know, the trajectory of my career. I sort of wanted to emulate what he had done. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's a little dated, but you know, you see Michael Keaton today. You think of you know the roles that he has that he has played recently because of um, the resurrection of his career because of Birdman, and you mm -hmm. think about those earlier roles. Mm -hmm. That's the role that I think of. 
Um, someone like Bruce Willis, um, who has obviously been in the news a lot lately, he's another guy mm -hmm. who like was trying to transition his career from like moonlighting to, you know, then he was an action star, but he wanted to be taken seriously as an actor. So what did he do? He took small roles in larger movies like uh, Pulp Fiction, you know, right. like Boxer and Pulp Fiction. Yeah, there's a lot of people who do that. If you if you've seen Deadpool two, there's a cameo with um, I think Matt Damon. I think it was that he's he's one of the characters that gets electrocuted, and oh. you only see his face for like a quick second. I'm pretty sure it's Matt Damon. Matt right. Damon was in the shooter, right? And the Born Identity. Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was Matt Damon. Yeah, it was yeah. Matt Damon. He's in Deadpool. Like it was like really weird. It was like I didn't know that for a minute. Oh. Yeah, most people don't. That's a little. That's a little cameo that most people they don't realize that. But my wife and I love Deadpool, so that's one of the things that I know. Yeah, it's a great I, movie. Though Deadpool three is probably going to be awesome. It's going to be fire. It's going to be right. amazing. Yeah, it's right. be yeah. amazing. Right. I'm throwing that out in the universe. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Or as I say, amaze balls. Amaze balls. <laughs> God, I haven't heard that in forever. I love it. <laughs> I'm trying to translate that in my head, and I can't come up with anything that's rated PG. Well, it's one of those, like, you know. Just the guy that threatened to show his testicles before the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I don't know. No, I don't know. No, I don't know. There's a line in uh, Splash. Uh, I don't know who it is. It's like a character actor when uh, – Daryl, Daryl Han is coming out of the water uh, by the Statue of Liberty, and there's a tour going on. And the tour guide sees her come out of the water, and she's completely nude. Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Botchy balls!" <laughs> do you remember that? Botchy balls. <laughs> That's how I would do the line reading for Amaze Balls. Amaze right? balls. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I think I kind of did that. So I did an episode of uh, um, Sledgehammer. You ever heard of this show? Mm -mm. Oh, yeah. Great. yeah. Yeah. Great show. It was a takeoff on um, uh, cl the Clint Eastwood character, Dirty Harry. Okay. Mm. Uh, the character actor, David Rashi, who's working today, amazing actor. Uh, plays this character very similar to Dirty Harry, and it's a comedy. It's like a sitcom, and his name was Sledgehammer. It's a little campy. He's like the Rockford, he's like Rockford kind of. Yeah, a little bit like Jim Rockford. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was a so I played was like one of my early roles in like '85 or something, um, and I played like some punk, and you know that was a couple of things that I did. I played punks. And this, the name of the punk, this is terrible, but the name of the guy, the character's name is 8-Track. So it gives you an idea <laughs> how long oh, ago God. it was 8-Track. Oh, wow. So anyway, so the the kids get into trouble and there's one scene, I'll never forget when I saw that I got to say it. So the character, the lead character comes to save the kids and my character, A Track, gets to scream out, It's Sledgehammer! <laughs> and that was just about the exact reading. And all I could think of was Bocce Balls. Bocce Balls. <laughs> Bocce Balls. That's solid. You That's know, the so three good. of us are going to be on other episodes later down the road, and we're gonna just going to be like, Bocce Balls! Oh, I'm going to record an episode after this, and it's going to be three, two, one, and we're live. Bocce Balls! Like, a hundred percent. Well, it's happening. <laughs> next time you watch Splash and you see that scene, then you know, that, I can remember the scene fine. Uh, I, can't I can't remember. remember I can't remember that scene. <laughs> Although, in my defense, I saw Splash in like 2014. Yeah, but so don't you guys have like you know lines from movies that roll around in your head oh. that whenever you see I, something? I got three languages stuck in my head, man. Like it's. <laughs> And they can fighting. tell you, yeah, and, and they're, they're fighting. fighting, and they're they're all angry too. Like it's like, ah! and you're like, oh god, like what is this? They all argue with each other. They do sometimes. <laughs> like you'll hear like, look, look, look at, look at now you're scaring them. <laughs> you're scaring them. Look at him. He's like, what the fuck did I get into it's here? It's like, what am I doing? <laughs> so I do want to bring up another movie that you've been in. It's an awesome movie, and actually a great song by one of my favorite bands, oh. God Godzilla. Oh yeah. 1998 Godzilla. How was that? 
Oh you, my God. A huge thrill. Amazing. So if you know about the about the series, right? The old Godzilla series. So I grew up with those. So I grew up in a household where I have an older brother who controlled the television set. So it was always um, Stuart, go change the channel. You know, I want to watch this or keep going, keep change the channel. So my brother was into he liked old movies with, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, old, you know, black and white movies with William Powell and uh, Edward D. Robinson, and then also loved monster movies. So that are, those original Godzilla movies stuck in my head for many, many years, and they have a yep. very special place in my heart. And we can talk about all of those Godzilla movies. So when a former actor turned producer, Dean Devlin, was rebooting, the Godzilla franchise because he had done. Um, I think by that point he, I think he wrote Universal Soldier, uh, Universal Soldier. But Dean Devlin was an actor. Another uh, great movie. And Is that so, the one with Van Damme? Yes. Okay, I remember. I that think one. he, I think he wrote that. Not sure, but I think he did. So then he did. Um, he produced Independence Day. Yeah. So of course that blew up, and so they gave him the rights to be able to reboot Godzilla. They were casting Godzilla, and so I went in for a very small role. Um, and um, supposedly, the story is is that there's a friend of mine who's in it, who's a character actor, been around for many years. His name is Malcolm Daynar. He was in Lords of Discipline and Heaven Help Us, and then eventually Godzilla. He was friends with Dean Devlin, so they were looking through tapes, and 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 Malcolm was like, "Hey, there's Stewart. Put him in the movie." So I get a call like a month later, six weeks later, that I got a I got a chance to go to work for uh, Dean and in this pivotal scene, which I was amazed that they kept it in. Um, so the things I remember was going to the to the set at Columbia in Culver City. Very first thing they do was they cut all my hair off. Cool. So they like shaved my head. So cool. you can't see it because I'm wearing a hat, but I was like literally for one day they they took off all my hair. My hair was significantly longer than it is now. Um, uh, and then having like some of the special effects around, I remember Dean walking around with the baby Godzilla. Um, eventually uh, the film was released and I got to go see it at the, the iconic Cinerama Dome with my wife and was thrilled to see that the entire scene that I did was in the movie and it was just incredible. So the movie, I'm curious now that I've talked about it. I'm curious what your view is as compared to the recent reboot because I have my opinion. I'm curious as to yours. I love, I love all of them because I'm the same way. I remember watching Creature Feature. I remember watching Godzilla, and I've always loved it. So every time there's a reboot of a Godzilla or something like that, King Kong, I'll watch it, and even if it sucks. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. You it's just, just that's, just, Dan. that's, that's just one of those things <laughs> that, you know, I'm just one of those people. I'm just kind of like, yeah, don't talk to me right now. You yeah. Know? They had to pay me a lot to cut my hair off, Stuart. I'm just saying. That's yeah. They didn't pay me a lot, Pops. I just, I mean, to be honest, I probably would have done it for free and just the residuals on it. I mean, right. You know, I'm really for, attached to this stuff, though. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> then he come and at me with the scissors out and said, "Ho, ho, ho, ho! Where's my chair?" Well, that's oh. why he's an actor, and you were not. Sometimes so, you got to give a little to get a little. So sometimes, uh, so I was doing this TV movie a long time ago, and um, it, it was a it was an extremely influential uh, movie of the week back when they were doing movie of the week sort of TV movie. There was an actor, so there were three actors that played very good friends. One was a lead actor. He was, and it was a, the story was about teenage pregnancy. And so the guy had a couple friends. I played one of his friends. Another actor played one of his friends. And the other actor had a pivotal scene at the end of the movie, which took place uh, like a year after they graduate from high school. And this student decides to make this terrible decision to have a child. 
Um, and so the other actor had a pivotal scene with the main character, but he refused to cut his hair. And so had a fight with the director. And so he was cut out of the scene and I was put into the scene because I would trim my hair. And it is one of the best scenes in the entire movie. So there you go, Pop. Well, like like, like I said, Pop, video. sometimes. <laughs> Listen, yeah, I had he hair. Who would have cut his hair off and then not? I had hair. hair twice as long as yours all through high school. It was literally touching my ass until I went to work with my co-host who trained me in the construction industry. And he actually drove me to the barbershop one day and said, if you want to keep your job. What does having hair feel like? Oh, dude, it's off. I love yeah, how I mean, you all had the same reaction. Oh, well, then I looked at you and oh, yeah, that's right. He's fucking bald. <laughs> I have a little piece of good stuff. Well, you it's know, wonderful, guys. It's ha wonderful. hair feels nice, but I want to know, you know, how does the wax feel? <sighs> oh, wow. I can't wait for this answer. Honestly, I here's the thing. I enjoy having my head shaved because when I'm training jujitsu and I feel my wet and I'm going to be nasty for a minute, my wet and sweaty hair touch the mat. It, it, uh, it just, it just, uh, but if it's just my head, it feels nice. Plus it gets, it's cooler. Like, you know, it's cooler. Yeah, I, I mean, chicks I dig it. I don't know if you know this, but it's, you know, what, <laughs> Rico, it's all in how you wear it, man. Right, right. And I was going to go in the opposite direction, Rico. I was going to say, yeah, but that's not the head they told you to shave, Rico. <laughs> but I got wigs for it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to do all right. You got a Merkin? A Merkin wig? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Am I missing something? Oh, God, you no. Guys saw them? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Man, he jumped on that, bro, like a, like a tiger on the prowl. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> I think he's one of us, Ben. I think he's one of us. Man. I'm just saying, just you know, to Leo and Jeff that aren't here tonight, you see what happens when you guys aren't here? I derail shit quick, real quick. So, Stuart, I have a question about the, the Godzilla thing. You you said earlier you had your opinion on it. I personally think I've seen, I've seen the old ones, like from Jap Japan and, mm -hmm. you know, the new ones. I like that these things are being... How do I say this? Rebrated. I like that we're we're adding technology to make it look better and like feel better. But at the same time, I feel like it loses a little bit of that essence. Like when, when you see like the old ones, when they looked at Godzilla, you could see the fear. And in the new ones to me, I don't feel like there's that fear of this gigantic nuclear creature that should be a Pokemon that is just coming <laughs> out of the water to fuck everything up. And then you have these other gigantic creatures that should be Pokemon too, that are coming out. Like that's just my opinion. How do you Where feel do you about think that? Pokemon came from? <laughs> Pokemon was born from Godzilla. Hell that's yeah! Probably, think about it. it. A, They're pocket monsters. All they did is shrink them. Yeah, it's true. Godzilla is nothing more than a Charizard. That saying. is that is not my opinion. Oh, in case look at that. Um, oh God, no, no, I am not ben breaking that. out the the Chiaz, the Chiazard reference. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's the Chiazard. Good. That's, and that's when Ben got a knock on the door. Hello, this is Nintendo, <laughs> Mr. Ben. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I told you earlier, I'm in the process of moving, so I'm pulling the stuff out that I have to give to the kids. And since you mentioned it. Look at that. It's the big boy Charizard. Oh, wow. It's the big one. It's yeah. the EX one. Okay. And he, no, just dropped, he, just, he just dropped the cert. Ah! No, he just dropped, dropped the $300 the, card. That's all right. But he landed in my lap. He survived. My so, son yeah, I had to separate Alex. a bunch of stuff that I leave in here that it's, it's the kid stuff and whatnot. My son used to collect the cards and he had a poster and he, he prided himself on knowing every single one every single pokemon i mean pride it i still know the original 151 oh, okay but the, listen, the Stuart, I'm, listen i'm hurt like uh, on the other side of that green screen two yeah. doors away is a 31 year old son of mine that can tell you every single one of the fucking pokemons and where they're from yeah my it's, it's, it's not normal it's not normal my son so you get that's how you get those panties to drop ben you just don't get it Oh, is that what it is? Is that what I've been doing wrong? Bro, you go you go to Comic Cons all the time. Stuart, you go to Comic Cons too. You see all these chicks 
dressed yeah. up. Yeah. We just want a nerdy boy that can name all 151 Pokemon. Bro. Look, all my son could do it. He's caught them all. He's had every version of every game. Wow. Okay? When, when the grandkids started wanting to play, they didn't get to play on the PlayStation. They had to start with the Game Boy, just like. Oh, bro, that's how I started. Exactly. <laughs> we made the grandkids start. 1999, with no bro. I remember that bulky thing that I used to have to like have a lamp that definitely probably gave me cancer. I was playing on that shit late at night. <laughs> like, I Did remember that. The, one, the blue Did one, the, the silver one, the black one. We got all the versions. All the, you know, we made him wow. do it all the same way that my son did it. Right. it he, he made him progress the same uh, way. Stuart had something to say. I was just going to say, well, first of all, I was going to say, now I was going to say I had no idea that this conversation would venture into a very serious discussion about Pokemon. <laughs> you did it I. I really did not. I didn't anticipate that. You we started talking about movie. Godzilla. Well, I know. Well, Pops brought up the fact that uh, Godzilla was born out of Pikachu. So uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Well, bringing it back to bringing it back to Rico's question. The so the first of all, I don't have any problem in any of the stuff that I've done. Uh, taking a critical view, uh, look at it. It 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 just is it's not something that I've ever had a problem with any of the work that I've done or any of the shows that I've done. Uh, the, the answer is, I, I mean, I like to be entertained. So, you know, the, I love the fact that, um, that Hollywood continues to reboot things as long as they're entertaining and they're bringing something new to the table. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my personal opinion about the Godzilla I was in, I didn't really care for it. However, it took a life of its own. It was played nonstop after it hit, you know, cable and and uh, 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 the cable channels and, and pay TV. It took a life of its uh, cr crazy as it seems. It was played over and over and over and over again. So so clearly people enjoyed it, which is fantastic. However, I will say the new version of it, or the or the one that was rebooted again with Brian Cranston, I really like that. I really like the more yeah. the, the, the more realistic approach. Uh, the the one that I was in was a little campier. It was a little campier. Um, uh, it was a little uh, a little ha ha, a little cutesy, um, and it sort of went along with what they were producing at the time, which that that team was producing. Um, Dean and uh, the director. Remember, uh, geez, I don't remember the director's name. It, it, it'll come to me, but I prefer the the new versions. <laughs> That's just my my take on it. When so, you say entertained, what do you mean by entertained? Like that you enjoy doing it, that you like the the writing, you like the vibe of it. Like, what do you all do you mean by that? Well, I'm just talking about you know just as a as a moviegoer like you like mm, an audience, okay like an okay. audience member that's all I'm talking yeah. about okay. yeah okay. I mean the the fact that you know that that I was in that movie and and thankfully I have a nice you know I have a nice chunk of you know film that I was a part of it definitely means way more to me than my personal opinion of how it came out uh, you know that's just you know, the same thing can be said for um, Teen Wolf 2. I mean, I've had a lot of conversations about that recently. Last year was the 35th anniversary, so I did, you know, a couple of podcasts discussing that. I don't think it's a, you know, it's not a great movie. It's not nearly as good as the original. Um, but it's, you know, to each his own. Everybody has, everybody has their own opinion. Everybody has their own. Exactly. A job's a job. Thanks, Vic. Um, I think also the problem is that, and, and this is just, I, I'd like your, your opinion on this is, I think a lot of people do a lot of gatekeeping. Does, does that make sense? And I think a lot of times, like you see this, like I'm a big horror fan, right? Like um, who's the, the nice woman that we had from the Hills Have Eyes? Uh, uh, Sarah. I can't remember her name, but we had the, the blonde from the, the original Hills Have Eyes, Ben. Oh. Yeah, I can't remember. Her name. I can't remember her name right now. Lovely woman. And that was one of the things that screen we had queen. talked to her. She's a scream queen is like people just like to gatekeep. And yeah. I feel like I see that happen in a lot 
But do you think that's part of the issue? Because I, that's how I've always felt when it comes to movies and people are like, well, fuck Teen Wolf 2 or fuck Teen Wolf 1. And I'm like, what's what's the problem? Like, wh why? Why are we doing this? Enjoy the fucking movie. Like, do you feel like that's something that happens? Um, I think that people have a – so what I found today is a lot of people have – like their like a personal affiliation with whatever they they've seen. I mean, it's the reason why we're all having right. this conversation now. Is you know, quite clearly, I haven't done a lot of work lately, but a lot of the work that I did do resonates with a lot of people that you know that saw it in the '80s and '90s and throughout. You know, like right. it's the only reason why you know ski school is you know is literally a cult classic i still get contacted constantly about that movie um not as much you know for they came from outer space because it wasn't shown that all over the you know all over the nation it was very specific although i know that you know people that did see it like it so people get protective of those memories rico that's i mean if you were, if we're talking seriously about it that's yeah that's what i think people do people get very uh, personal about those movies so like a movie like team wolf 2 like i said i mean when i saw it i was like this is i mean this is not that good i mean it's not nearly as good as the first one and, and for me as an audience member all i could think was they had an opportunity to capitalize on a successful franchise and what did they do they ended up duplicating it but for people that were you know 13 14 15 16 at the time they don't give a shit about that all they all they care about is what emotion they they uh, that is a vote at when seeing that movie so i i don't know if that answers your question i know i know no, it, it does it okay. does because it's more what you're trying to say it's more of people have a an emotional attachment to what they yeah. see and when they yeah. feel like that's being taken away they get defensive which is understandable totally. you know it's like yeah. it, it's it's a feeling attached to that and you don't want to see it's like Star Wars, for example, not not to go on a dark hole on here, but you see that a lot, and and mm. that totally explains a lot. Then I, I just appreciate want to that. say, from an artist, <coughs> an artist's job is to elicit an emotional response. Okay, yep. a director's job, a writer's job, an artist's job is to elicit an emotional response. Whether good or bad makes no difference. If they got you to respond emotionally to what they did, it's a success. Sure. It's true. It's, it's, when, when you look at it from that side of it, then you go to the button seats. Okay, I came into this whole podcasting thing and everything from a fan's position, a, a comic fan's position. Yep. Okay, so when I read a book, if I get an emotional response, if, you know, if it touches me, then I want to see the next book, right? That's pretty much how all of it works. Entertainment is touching your fans. Yeah. I think you're reading a lot of erotica, Pops. I think you got to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do a lot of cons. You can't those touch are, the fans. Those, <laughs> those, don't touch those the are fans. spectator sports. I'm not into that. I'm a participator. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> it's like every time we get one... You know, you got a Twitter account. You get hit with those those yeah. OnlyFans account. Everybody, every girl on there trying to get you to follow them, right? I delete them as fast as they follow me. I don't play into that crap. I'm trying right. to promote artists, writers, comics, you know. I mean, um, I, I don't need 50% of my followers to be OnlyFans girls. No, no, no. I, I need okay. my followers to be fans, creators, All right. people like Stuart. Stuart, we have a huge network. There's other people in our network that are going to want to talk to you. Okay, so don't be surprised if you get some some of the showrunners from the madness hitting you up saying, "Hey, you want to come on our show?" Oh, good. Um, ever I since we that there is, man, there, we kind of pass some people back and forth. You know, it's like, look, this person fits on your show. You need to talk to this person, whatnot. You know, um, it's, it's all about networking, and and yep. it, you know, if you get the fans excited about what you're doing, no matter what it is. No, it's true. You know? It's true. I mean, Jeff and I found that out four and a half years ago. So to touch on something you asked way earlier, Stuart, about the name of the show, Still Toking. Yes. My business partner and I uh, were sitting on a beach in St. Lucia with our wives talking about 
a t-shirt business that we had 30 years ago about the benefits of cannabis. But back then we didn't have the internet. We, we were advertising in like high times magazine yep. and it really didn't do anything. Life happened, blah, blah, blah. So we were sitting on the beach and I said to him, I found all the old stuff. And then we started snowballing. And I said, the two biggest things in the country right now are zombies and the decriminalization of cannabis. I said, we got to mix them. Nobody's ever done it. <laughs> so we wrote, I started, I started writing a novel. He's more of the editor, but he'll look over my shoulder and go, it needs something like this. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> we actually wrote a novel called Toking with the Dead. From that the novel, those two things together. we took cannabis and weed and stuck it together. But we also put ourselves as the main characters in the comic because we've known each other for 36 years. We have a very slapstick humor. See, there's the cover of the comic. And because I'm that kind of guy, right? I freaking have one. I have also. So we kind of did things ass backwards. And instead of releasing the novel, we pulled five comic books from the novel that we didn't think were going to do much. And it kind of exploded. Yeah. So from that, we have done, you know, many events, but we have the five comics, the novel. We started this broadcast four years ago on one platform. Now we're on 22 worldwide with over 250,000 viewers. Um, We've filmed two episodes of the TV series with Diamond Production Studios in New York. We have a two and a half minute animation pitch out. So that's kind of where the still toking came from. It came from that little, yeah, he's got Bill Diamond's autograph down there in the corner. He's all excited. Look at him. I held uh, but that's, that's how the show, the show actually started just like what we started as a joke. And it all I, I went to Jeff. I said, I want to start an online show. He goes, no, no effing way. I, it's way out of my comfort zone. And at the time, I looked at him and said, well, we have a very good friend, Philo Barnhart from Disney, who created The Little Mermaid, worked on Star Trek, uh, numerous other things. And it was the 30th anniversary for The Little Mermaid. And, and he had been interviewed. Nobody posted it. So I kind of pulled the heartstring got Jeff to commit to doing one show and here we are four years later still doing it. So the online show was a podcast was. Yeah. Was so, it? yeah. So the, uh, it, this broadcast live broadcast show, um, we started right before COVID and it was just it something, it was just something to get yeah. people in front of fans because everybody has seen something that you've been in, but, who is Stuart? You know, where is Stuart? What, what's he up to? What's he do? And my question, and because I didn't ask many questions because I've been listening to everything that you guys have been saying and really into the conversation, but I've been looking over your shoulder and there's a football in a case. Yes. So I would assume you're a sports fan. I am a sports fan. And, and just curious, uh, who's the autograph? That is an autograph. For, so it's not coincidentally enough so i live in la so i'm an la sports fan that is a football sign by joe montana that very I, nice i got at a um auction oh no excuse me at a um raffle at a right, raffle a raffle and that's a football sign by joe montana so in front of me which you can't see so you can see you can see the pictures here, the Beatles here, and then there's a picture of them playing on the roof there. And then right there is a picture of Florence, Italy, but in front of me here is a bunch of sports memorabilia, a picture of uh, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird signed by them. Very nice. Larry Bird retired. And then a picture of the, my four favorite Dodgers are there as well from the 70s. So, Very cool. so, yes, I'm a huge sports fan, and I'm a Very cool. memorabilia collector. That's that's I excellent. A little bit. I got a little bit of cool stuff, too. Um, yeah. See, most of mine's all Boston it's stuff. It's but. <laughs> and it's okay. there, there, hey, listen, there's Larry Bird right there, man. You said it. You said it right there. And that, you know, when he retired, no offense, when he retired, I kind of stopped watching basketball. It just wasn't the same anymore. Why would that have? Oh, why oh, would that, oh, that, oh, that genre, I should say. Bird, yeah. McHale. You know, Magic Johnson, that whole genre, when that kind of phased out in the late 80s, early, I was just like, this is not fun anymore. 
So you weren't a fan of Boston when they when they literally took over the the NBA again with um, Kevin Garnett and uh, Ray Allen. You weren't a fan. Of I I was like, oh, cool, we won. Get his yeah. eyes screwed. His eyes switching. His eyes. No. Switching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I fell out of my seat backwards, and the Red Sox broke the curse. I was like, holy shit, it actually happened. And then when the Bruins took the cup in 2011, I was like, I get to buy a bigger TV. <laughs> you know. But the Patriots but, won yeah, so much I mean, that I it just, just became, lost and then we won again, right? <laughs> That's true. I, I, I live in Missouri, so the Kansas, the Chiefs are like always doing something. So, and I'm a Ravens fan, so yeah, you probably guess that my wife pegs me, and you're right. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, we only got a couple minutes. Oh, with a with a Chiefs dildo. Sorry. So, right. any last questions from either you or you two? No, I thank you so much for doing this. Like it's it's pops. It's you got really a an last question for our amazing about. guest. Well, I I think we asked before the show if he had anything coming up that that he was excited about. He said. So I've got you know some things that I'm trying to develop now okay. um, that involve um, um, you know some of the stuff that I've done in the past, but taking a more satirical view of them because i think that when you when you pull up anything that's that old you know or like 10 years then you better have you have you have to have another take on it i know we sort of mentioned that yeah. earlier that's that you better come at it in an original way so some of the stuff that i'm trying to develop has is more satirical but it's definitely around some of the stuff that we've talked about and, and discussed and some of it does involve dean cameron as well so he, he's another dude that you should you should have him on your radar. He's a he's a fun interview too. So hopefully yeah. another. It came from outer space with Tommy Chong in it. Right, right. Yes. Well, I mean, it would be a welcome would... addition. I wish there. I wish that. That's the one thing, Rico, that I that throughout all my career, wish that show continued. It should have continued. Well, we well you never know. You never know. You know. You never know who's this watching. This is the age of the reboot. I'm just right, saying. Right. Right. Totally. Is- yeah. Age of the oh. reboot. As long as you do it right. Exactly what I said, pops. Exactly. Where what would I it go it. though? Like, what network would you put it? Like, it's cable. I mean, if you watch that show, there was always a hint of sex in it. There was always like a scantily clad bikini girl walking through there. There was always hints. Um, I think Netflix would be better for that, Stuart. Yeah. I, I think whatever. I think, There's a yeah. hundred streaming services exactly. out there. We can find one that would work. Trust me. We don't put We're affiliated with quite a few of them. We need to make this, dude. I would have a heart attack if you announce and we're doing it with Tommy. Jo- I would a hundred percent probably like like pass out. That would be that would be a pretty cool thing to watch. Uh, Yes, yeah, so if, if people want to go to my website, I have, uh, they can go to stuartbradkin.com. They can ask me questions. A lot of that, that website I built has a lot of the original scripts and call sheets and photos from all the shit that I've done throughout the years that I share with fans. So go there, ask me questions, read the scripts, <clears throat> look at the, my notes and all that stuff. It's it's and in fun. case you guys missed that website, just check the show notes up above or down below because it's in there. Trust me. It's in the chat over there, too, for those of you right? watching on the Madness. So now, now that Stuart, so where do you like to interact with your fans? What social media platforms? Uh, probably the majority of the, the folks, uh, uh, the fans uh, contact me through Instagram or Facebook or, or certainly they can email me as well. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Pops, you're up. Madness Comic Network, you guys know what's up. The comic-related re- madness on Facebook, where it all began. Comic Talk with Pops Van Zandt on YouTube. Uh, you know, we're on Twitter, Madness Comic. We're all over the place, man. We're everywhere. Everywhere. Nice, nice. So, and I know I heard another voice over there. Why didn't he let you come on the show with him tonight? I got... I, I, we were so hog all... Attention for himself. He just can't help. I, I, yeah, I kind of figured that's what happened. 
Because I saw him look over and I'm like, Eric's over in the corner. He put Eric in the fucking corner. What a he prick. Did. He did. And I didn't even do anything Nobody wrong. puts Eric in the corner. Rico, you're up, brother. Thank you so much for, for having me on. And thank you for Mr. Stewart for answering the questions. It's been awesome. I, I feel like we have so many more things we could talk about, but you can follow myself yeah. and my co-host Eric McElroy on the Rico Podcast. And it's the Rico Podcast on everything on Apple, YouTube, everywhere. Spotify. Spotify everywhere. So thank you so much for having us, Ben. We appreciate it. Anytime, brother. Anytime. Totally so, appreciate it. <laughs> I want to say thank you to my amazing co-host tonight, Rico from the Rico Podcast, Pops and Zant from the Comic Madness Network. Make sure you go over and check them out. You know, we're here on the Dorkening Podcast Network. Tons of shows, tons of people doing tons of shit. I want to say thank you to Stuart, but most of all, I want to thank all our veterans and first responders for doing what they do so people like us can do what we do. Stay safe. We'll see you next week. We're out of here.